could turn in your Bibles so long to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. While you're doing that, I'm going to ask uh, Bill, the deacons, to help us just hand out a little gift that I want to give to you. It's a DVD. It's got uh, four messages on that DVD. And uh, some of you will have received this as I've been around to your houses and I've visited and I've dropped it off with you. It's a project that I've been working on for some months and is just about finished. It's not the whole series. It's four out of 22. But um, I want you to have a look at that DVD. Go through it yourself. Make a copy of it. Share it with somebody else. It deals with the problem of addiction. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a powerful message that there is hope that goes beyond addiction. There is one who can save from the problem of addiction. The first lecture on here is my personal story. If you didn't catch it on Hope Channel, you will be able to check it out on the DVD. The second one is one which I really want every young person to watch, and of course every parent. So if you're only going to watch one, then I'm going to encourage you to watch number two. It looks at the party scene that has taken the world by storm. It's a background that I come out of. And it asks the question, is it just a rave of a time? Is it just a good time or is it an act of worship? And you're going to think that's a strange question. But we go through the party scene and we look at it from the perspective of the party organizers and what their intentions are using their materials, using their statements. And we, you discover something very, very interesting about that scene. And so I encourage every young person just to have a look at that because we get caught by the lights and by the glamour and by the fun and by the entertainment and we don't realize that there is a spiritual reality to it. So really have a look at at least lecture number two on that DVD. And then the last two, part one and two of a topic that's entitled Chain Reaction, will uh, give you an understanding of what goes wrong in the brain when addiction takes place. How does it work? Why can't I just smoke my cigarettes for 10 years and walk away from them when I'm ready to give them up? Why can't I do my ecstasy, my cocaine or my anything else and just walk away after a little while of having some fun? And so that's a, those two are quite scientific and we look at how that works in the brain. And once you understand that, you can understand what may be needed for the process of healing. If you want more of them, uh, there's a website on the DVD. Do visit that website. There's Bible study resources there. It's my personal website. There's more of the series in video format on the website that you can have a look at and uh, details to get more of the, of the actual DVDs if you want them. So please have a look at that. Make copies of this DVD. Give it to your neighbors. Give it to your colleagues. Give it to your friends. This DVD is free of copy, so please. Were there any left, Bill? None? Okay. So I've got one more left if somebody wants it and didn't get. All right. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for why we have gathered here today. You have given us hope. Hope that goes beyond the entrapment of sin. Hope that goes beyond our addictions. Hope that goes beyond our failings. And today, like no other time, we really focus on how it is that you've given us this hope. Will you bless us as we turn to the word, as we focus for a moment. Bring to our imaginations the scenes that we are celebrating today. In Jesus' name, amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is one of those verses in my experience that I've really spent a lot of time meditating on. And to me, it's one of the most profound verses. It's up there with the one that you could all probably recite from memory in John 3, verse 16. Another profound verse. Everyone knows John 3, 16, I think. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. A verse that is so often quoted that I think the profoundness of it is often lost. You know, we quote it glibly. We just uh, recite it from memory because we all know it so well. But that verse is really paralleled here by 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. They are saying the same thing in different words. And what they are saying is really the center, the center of our hope. 
It's the, without that, without that teaching, without the concept that's conveyed in those words of John 3, 16, and these words of 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, you and I would be here without a point. You and I would be here meaninglessly. There would be no reason to get up in the morning. There would be no hope that goes beyond this life. In fact, the chances are that life would have terminated in the Garden of Eden. That the prophecy that Jesus had made to Adam and Eve, that in the day you eat thereof, you will surely die, that prophecy would have been literally and absolutely fulfilled the moment they ate their fruit. It was not because of John 3 verse 16. Because of 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. A probationary time, an extension of life was secured because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Because he, God, the father, made him, Jesus, the son, who knew no sin to be sin for us. What I find absolutely profound about that verse is, is, is it, it, the way in which Christ identified with sin, the extent to which he did it. When you go in for surgery or you go and see a doctor and there's something wrong with you and you go into his surgery there or maybe you are actually on the operating table and uh, there's something wrong with your heart or your kidneys or your whatever and they've got to go in there, you know, they've got to get their hands dirty, so to speak. They've got to literally take the scalpel and cut through the layers of skin and fat and then take a, 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 a saw and cut through your chest, um, your, your, your ribs here in the, the sternum. Had the privilege of seeing that as part of my course requirements, studying theology. Strange, right? And they go in there and they take out the veins from your legs and they tie them back into the heart so that they bypass the clots that you've developed over time. And if you're thinking this is too graphic, there's a reason why it's graphic. So I want you to see what it's like. It's messy. But you know that those doctors do not get dirty. They are so well protected, they never come in contact with your disease. He's saying, Adrian, you just said they're operating on you. They just cut your sternum open. They, 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 they just re extracted uh, veins from your legs and sewed them into your, your, the arteries of your heart and bypassed your clots. And what do you mean they don't get dirty? They do not physically touch your contamination. They are dressed in a sterile suit. They are, they, 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 their gloves, they, their hands are covered in latex gloves. They even wear funny little shoe covering thingamajiggies. So that when they step into the, the bounds of that red square, where no one that hasn't sterilized themselves may go, they remain sterile. They cut you open, they work on you. Your blood splatters. They hopefully fix the problem. And they leave clean. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says that's not how God dealt with your sin problem. That's not how he dealt with your infection. That's not how he dealt with your diseased condition. He did not put on his spiritual latex gloves and his sterile suit. He did not go into some sterile environment where he knew he was protected and no harm could come to him. He did not take your sin from you with his little latex spiritual gloves, carry it at arm's distance from himself, and go dump it in some you know, universal spiritual trash can somewhere and walk away from it. Take off his latex gloves and go back to heaven and say, Oh, look, great, sin was dealt with and I didn't get dirty. He physically came into contact with our sin. He physically took our sin into his being. It does not say that he, for, for, for God, the Father, asked Jesus to carry our sin. It says that God, the Father, made him who knew no sin. The, the, the one whose character was completely unblighted by sin, who had never chosen with an act of volition to say, yes, I want to engage in rebellion against God. I want to transgress the commandments of God. I want to go against them. This one who is what God is, who had never been separated from the other two members of the Godhead. Can you even imagine what happens on the cross? 
He doesn't put on his spiritually sterile stuff and go in there and take your sin and, ster- and, and deal with it in a sterile manner. It says that God the Father made him who knew no sin to be sin. He became what sin is. He took it into his being. He became what you and I are by nature. He took that upon himself so that he became fully identified with our sin. So that God could pour out the punishment that was due to you and me. That you and I should have taken into our beings because we chose it, because we became what sin is. He took our place. He became defiled by it so that the Father could pour out the hatred of sin that should have been yours and mine. On him. And he drank that cup to the end. It's a phenomenon I I can't even get my mind around. (laughs) That he would be willing to do that for me. That he would be willing to go into the universal operating theater without any protective gear, knowing that he was going to walk out, or not walk out, I should say knowing that he was going to die on the operating theater so that you and I could walk out. It's a phenomenal concept. But it's the only way that our salvation could be secured. The choice God had was very simple. Only one of two options. Walk away from us. Let us bear our own consequences. Terminate life on earth. For the wages of sin is death. Or come down here without any spiritual protective gear. Take our place. Become what we are. And reap the consequences of our choices. For the Father made the Son who knew no sin. To be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That we might become the righteousness of God in Him. But the story goes beyond what Jesus went through. It goes beyond Him becoming sin for us. Have you ever thought at a communion service like this, what it must have done to the Father? Now we focus on Jesus, and rightly so, for it was Him on the cross. But if you are a parent, and you have ever had to severely punish your children, like perhaps before the anti-smacking law, you will know that if you love your children, it brings no joy to discipline your children, right? Particularly when you know that pain is inflicted. When my children do something wrong and it's time for discipline, I don't rush into the bedroom saying, yes, I'm so glad. I've been waiting for this all week. They finally stepped over the mark and now it's my opportunity. You know, I just live for this moment. In fact, I usually try and delay the punishment. Even after I've said the next time you do this, there will be consequences. Even when that time comes, I, 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 I kind of extend it sometimes and I'll say, okay, well, next time you do this. Because it brings no joy to a father's heart to have to discipline his children. It hurts. I never used to understand that as a child, you know, when I was being bent over the bed with my mother's, with my mother's big arm behind me and a, a slop in her hand, you know. And I'd say, well, we don't like doing this, you know. And I'd be thinking, well, why are you doing it? And then they would say something to me, you know, when I was six years old. You'll understand one day that we don't like doing this. And I thought, now, yeah, whatever. And now I do. And now I do understand. It brings no joy to my heart. Have you ever thought of what the father went through in doing this to his son? And make no mistake, the language in the scripture is very, very clear. There is no passivity here. There is no simply letting things reap the natural consequences. There was divine 
active, intentional judgment that was poured out on Jesus Christ. There are times when your children make wrong choices and you simply let things be and they reap the consequences of their choices. But there are other times when you deliberately and intentionally step in and there is active judgment, so to speak. The cross is active judgment. It says here that he, the father, made him the son. He took him from what he was and he made him something else. The one who had known no sin became sin for us. And the Father judged humanity actively, like what will happen at the end of time in the hell in hellfire. Active judgment. And by the way, you know why hell is so sad? Because everybody that is destroyed in the fires of hell one day was paid for at the cross. Their punishment, their sentence of death, was borne by Christ already. He didn't die simply for those who he knew in his foreknowledge would accept his gift. You know, I'm going to pay for, for Brian because I know Brian is going to accept me one day. On the other hand, Basil, forgive me Basil, I know Basil's not going to accept me, so we'll leave him. He'll bear his own punishment one day. No. For God so loved the world, without discrimination, that he paid the price for every sin of every person, past, present, and future. So that what happens at the end cannot be said was because there wasn't provision made. Every sin was paid for by every human being. Why then must they die? Their concert? Why must they take that? Because if I give you a check for a million dollars and I'm good for it, but you don't go to the bank and cash it, you cannot reap the benefits of it. I've written it. I've given it. I've set it aside. It's there. It's for you. The price is there paid. But unless you take it and cash it, it can do you no good. The check was written at the cross. Every single human being on earth can be free. Because he who knew no sin became sin in their behalf, in our behalf. He was there on the cross for you, for me. But they did not go to the bank and cash it. What does that mean in practice? We did not make the choice to accept it. We saw it afar off. We heard the story. But we were distracted. We were busy. Hey, maybe we even liked the sin, the price for which was paid by Christ. We liked it so much. We were too busy, too distracted, too in our own little world. To accept what he had done for us. To accept that act of judgment of God upon Christ in our behalf. And so at the end, they must pay their own price. Though their price was paid. The nature of the death of Christ was not like when you and I go to sleep. What we call the first death. You know where you sleep in Jesus awaiting the second coming? The nature of the death of Christ was the equivalent of what the Bible tells us is the second death, from which there is no resurrection for the wicked. He died that death for us, where God actively rejects and separates himself from those who have become so identified with sin that it is impossible to separate them from their sin. And in rejecting sin, he inevitably has to reject those who cling to it. If your ship is sinking and someone throws you a lifeline, but you love that sinking ship so much that you hang on to the mast for dear life and you will not take the lifeline that has been thrown, then it is inevitable that you will go down with your ship. And there's nothing anybody can do about that. The lifeline has been thrown. And the question today is, have you and I Chosen to cling to the ship which is going down? Or have we grabbed the lifeline that Christ has thrown? For the Father made the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in Him. 
That's what we're doing today with the bread and with the wine. His body was broken in judgment. Your judgment and my judgment. His blood was spilt in judgment. Your judgment and my judgment. When I speak of judgment, I always ask people, which is the greatest judgment in Scripture? Was it the Noahic flood? The world was destroyed in water. Is it the coming lake of fire where God rains down the fire and the brimstone from heaven? And inevitably everyone says, yes, it's that one. It's still coming, right? No. The greatest, most comprehensive, most powerful, fullest judgment in Scripture happened 2,000 years ago. In Christ, on the cross, where sin was once and for all and definitively dealt with by the judgment of God. Where every human being was judged in Him. Today, you and I take these bre these, this bread and this wine. We take it into our bodies as a symbol that we have made a choice to receive Christ into our souls. That we have recognized that what happens at the cross is that he takes my place. He takes my judgment. He dies on the operating table. And I walk out with new life. That he didn't have his rubber latex gloves on. But that to heal us, it cost him everything. So friends, as we celebrate that, I pray that you will keep these scenes before you and that you will meditate on these things. Before we se separate for the foot washing, we're going to have an item of music that will be shared with us. Just lost their dearest friend. All that he said, now he was dead. So this was the way it would end. The dreams they had dreamed were not what they seemed. Now that he was dead and gone. The garden, the jail, the hammer, the nail. How could a night be so long? Then came the morning. Night turned into day. The stone was rolled. Kings from afar, the wedding, the water, the wine. Now it was done, that taken a son, wasted before his time. She knew it was true, she'd watched him die too. She'd heard them call him just a man. 
but deep in her heart she knew from the start somehow her son would live again then came the morning night turned into day the stone was rolled Death had lost and life had won, for morning had come. Then came the morning, night turned into day, the stone was rolled away, hope rose with the door. Let's pray together as we say prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being willing to do to your Son what needed to be done to provide our salvation. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being willing to bear that cross. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for making that cross a reality in our daily lives. And as we go and we separate for the foot washing, Lord, May these scenes stay with us. May we spiritually enter in to what we will be physically practicing. In Jesus' name. read to you from Luke chapter 22, recounting what, uh, what happened on that evening of the Lord's Last Supper. It says, when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. I invite you to kneel as uh, Jim leads us in prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, Lord, we're just so humbled this morning to come before you and to realize that you were given by your Father in heaven to die for us and to come sin. And Lord, we just cannot really fathom this, but Lord, we do thank you for your amazing love and sacrifice on our behalf. So, dear Father, as we partake in this emblem of the bread this morning, it signifies your broken body, and Lord, help us never to forget your love and your sacrifice for us, we pray in your name.
Was anybody missed? Everybody's been served. The words of Paul as he recounts that evening, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. invite you just to slip to your knees to continue in the frame of prayer as Gary leads us. Dearest Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we know, Lord, that without shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. And Father, the fact that uh, your Son had to shed his blood for each and every one of us makes us sorrowful, Lord, because he took our place. And as his blood, Lord, hit the dust of the earth, we, we are just so thankful, Lord, to realize that uh, we have forgiveness in Jesus' name. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we pray that you prepare each and every one of us about here this morning to take hold of the sacrifice as it's truly given, Lord, and to always remember that it was for him, for us, that Jesus died. In Jesus' name we thank you.
Paul goes on to say that in the same manner that Jesus also, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Mark chapter 14, verse 26, it makes this brief statement about how the Last Supper ended. It says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, the place where the atonement in our behalf began. So friends, let us follow that example and sing together this wonderful hymn, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross.
Heavenly Father, we thank you again for all that you have done to ensure that we will spend eternity with you in heaven above. How we thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice that was made. And we pray that as we go from this place, that you will keep the scenes of the cross we've just sung about ever before us. For we pray it in Jesus' name.